I would like to welcome you very much to Moderna Museet Malmö. My name is Joa Jungberg and I am the curator behind a project that we have been presenting this autumn and winter and for another two days, namely Sensing Nature from Within. It is a project with which we have wanted to provide a platform for this fascinating search process that is going on and that is involving more and more people all over the world and it growing in intensity. A search process that is looking at how we can be human beings in other ways and in relation to a more than human world. It is a searching process for nothing less, I believe, than a different worldview. And please note that I say different and not new, since there are examples of cultures that have managed to safeguard a more life-affirming and holistic worldview against all odds. Sensing Nature from Within comprises an art exhibition with 12 participating artists and artist groups from different parts of the world. It is shown in the turbine hall behind you and also in this room which we have temporarily borrowed from the Otolit group that are showing a film called O Horizon here normally. Important to mention, however, is that this project also includes an extensive program of lectures, discussions and performances. And this has been made possible through an extremely fruitful collaboration with Agenda 2030 Graduate School at Lund University. Thank you so much, Lund University. I also would like to thank our program producer, Linnea Jan, and I would like to thank Region Skåne, who has helped us with an um, extra financial support to make this happen. Today we are gathered for the fourth and final seminar that we are organizing as part of this project. And we have chosen to title this seminar Inner Transformation for a Sustainable World. We will get three very interesting presentations. First out we have Christine Wamsler, who is Professor of Sustainability Studies at Lund University, where she runs the research project the Contemplative Sustainable Futures Programme, which, if I have understood it correctly, examines if and how an inner transformation of people's souls and mind can have effect on sustainability globally. Thereafter we have Helena Granström, there are you, who is a writer, poet and journalist with a background in theoretical physics and mathematics. And in the summer of 2017, I can mention that I read Helena Granström's book Det som en gång var, What Once Was, maybe in English, where uh, she was walking around in the mountainous north and reasoning with herself about the culture, her culture, that has enabled and accepted an irreversible destruction of our living environment. And it's a book that was an important source of inspiration for me in this project. And then our third presentation will be held by Diego Galafassi, who some of you might recognize from our last seminar where he was the moderator. Diego Galafassi is an artist and a sustainability researcher at Lund University. And in his different practices, he has explored how imagination and creativity can inspire inner transformation necessary for changing our societies towards sustainability. And after these three presentations, uh, we will have a discussion moderated by Ludwig Bengtsson Sonneson here, who is a project manager and communicator at Sustainability Forum at Lund University. And during the second half of this discussion, uh, there will also be opportunities for us in the audience to ask questions or voice reflections. So with those words, I would just like to warmly welcome all four of you. And uh, now I will give the word to you, Ludwig, who will say a few words about the theme of today's seminar. Thank you. I think this uh, works. So you can hear me, right? Uh, I'm not going to keep on too long and I'm going to let Christine uh, introduce herself and her topic soon. Um, 
when I'm not at Sustainability Forum, I do research on climate futures and how we can use imagination to imagine different futures. And in that uh, task, I was in uh, Utrecht uh, this past week, hanging out with the climate modelers who work with the IPCC to model how future scenarios could look like and what those future scenarios would result in, in terms of global warming and other environmental effects. And it struck me that this theme could really uh, need to be discussed in those communities as well. Because in this culture of numbers, we take often their scenarios and their results as, as some sort of truth that can't be debated. But the truth is that when you come up with these scenarios of future societies, you have to make a lot of assumptions. And many of those assumptions are made based on a worldview that is historic, that is how we have done it before, which I'm sure Eliana will tell us more about how we have done it up until now. And if you build on those same assumptions, maybe you make the same mistake. And so hopefully I can get some uh, tips, some practices uh, during the discussion here today that I can bring back to the modeling community. And maybe we can together imagine more future, fruit, fruitful ways uh, of constructing society in the future. And so that was my very short uh, <laughs> reflection on this topic. Uh, I'm sure there will be many more interesting uh, comments to make in the future. With that, Christine, you want to take the stage? <coughs> Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Um, I would like to start my presentation by saying thank you to the organizers of this uh, Sensing Nature from Within exhibition and all associated events. It is extremely timely. It's, it's a very timely sounding board for new ideas on how we can develop a new relationship with our world, ourselves and to each other and why it is so important to uh, think about these things in our society today. I sincerely hope that my presentation will make a small contribution to your endeavors here at the museum by showing the importance of linking our inner dimensions and transformation with the field of sustainability, which, as you surely know, is a field of research, education and practice that focuses on meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I, I have structured my presentation around the two questions, why and how. First, I'll talk about why the two issues of inner dimensions and inner transformation are receiving increasing attention and recognition in the context of supporting sustainability. And second, I'll illustrate how this increasing recognition has led to the development of innovative education, teaching and networking activities at my workplace, Luxus, the, Center for Sus the Lund University Center for Sustainability Studies. Um, in this context, I will then present the content and some of the outcomes of our work. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Um, one of the main reasons why inner dimensions and transformation are receiving increasing attention and recognition as ways to support sustainability relates to the fact that our society's trajectories remain deeply unsustainable. In fact, we are facing increasingly complex sustainability challenges such as climate change, disasters, energy, food, waste and water management, biodiversity loss, etc., etc. The list is very long and all of these challenges require urgent solutions. It is thus clear that the dominant um, sustainability approaches have not so far catalyzed the necessary change and this is despite the prominence of sustainability as a concept and the associated goals and targets that have been set at global 
national and local levels beginning at the end of the 1980s. One reason for this situation is the fact that the vast majority of sustainability scholarship, education and practice has so far only focused on the external world of ecosystems, wider socioeconomic structures, technology and governance dynamics. At the same time, a second aspect of reality has been vastly neglected, and this is individuals and their inner dimensions. So, a major shortcoming of current approaches is thus the neglect of people's inner dimensions and capacities. And there is therefore a clear need to also look at sustainability from the other end specifically by investigating how individual inner dimensions and related transformation can impact sustainability at different levels and contribute to a broader cultural change towards sustainability. Accordingly, the concept of the inner or personal sphere of transformation for sustainability has been receiving growing attention in environmental science and education. And it can simply be understood as the powerful unleashing of human potential to commit, care and effect change for a better life. So, in other words, the concept of inner transformation de describes changes in the sphere of people's inner dimensions, um, which refers to people's mindsets, including their worldviews, beliefs, values, motivations, as well as associated cognitive, emotional and relational capacities, such as self-awareness, compassion and empathy. What is important to highlight in this text is the fact that people's mindsets are key leverage points for change towards sustainability and in fact we can think about them as so-called deep leverage points as they lie at the root of many sustainability challenges and are thus fundamental to our solutions. Um, the concept of low and deep leverage points was developed by Donella Meadows, a pioneering American environmental scientist, teacher and writer. Um, leverage points are places where we can intervene in a system um, for achieving change towards sustainability. So, here you can see an illustration that shows that deep leverage points, um, here shown on the right side, have great impact and address the inner or personal sphere of transformation. Um, while lower leverage points, here on the left-hand side, have less impact and tend to address practical or political spheres of transformation. So, this understanding of the role of low and deep leverage points in achieving change towards sustainability is related to the so-called iceberg model, which I will show on the next slide. Um, so, in simple terms, the model shows that only some aspects are visible to us here above the water, but much or um, around 90% or so, is hidden beneath the surface. So the iceberg model suggests that beneath the visible level of events or crises that define our world today, there are underlying patterns, structures and mental, mo mental models that are responsible for creating them. If these are ignored, uh, we will remain locked into re-enacting the same old patterns time and time again. So, in other words, the filters through which we interpret our experiences and choose among possible courses of action are invisible. Um, but at the same time, they are crucial because they inform the questions we deem appropriate to ask and underpin the structures, um, patterns and ultimately events that can be observed. So, based on this model, 
we can see that the capacity of individuals to reflect on their own mental models and assumptions and potentially adopt new paradigms is one of the most powerful ways to dramatically influence sustainability. Another reason why the concept of deep leverage points and in this context people mindsets have been has been discovered or rediscovered really as key for sustainability relates to recent advances in other disciplines as well. Um, for example, recent progress in social neuro science suggests that certain inner dimensions, capaci capacities or qualities are and associated associated expanded consciousness might open new pathways towards sustainability. So in this context, expanded consciousness means strengthening and opening up our capacity to be aware. And this includes our five senses, bodily sensations, mental activities, and our sense of connection to other people and to nature. So put together, um, there, this means that there is an urgent need for more integral approaches towards sustainability, which also address inner dimensions and transformation. And this in turn requires us to address the current separation between the community of sustainability scholars and practitioners and the community of consciousness scholars and practitioners, as you can see here, um, where I believe that art can certainly play a role in bridging this gap. So as we have just seen, on the one hand, sustainability scholars and practitioners currently mainly focus on ecosystems, wider socioeconomic structures, technology and governance, and in this context, the issue of inner transformation is often considered as non-scientific, private, private, or even esoteric. Then we have, on the other hand, um, consciousness scholars and practitioners, and they focus mainly on issues such as personal or adult development, health, well-being, um, leadership, etc., etc. And in this context, Sustainability is mainly considered at personal levels um, and is not related to wider societal or systemic aspects. Okay, so the urgent need for more integral approaches towards sustainability that also address inner dimensions has also increasingly been expressed by a diversity of international leaders and scholars. And here are two examples which I particularly like. The first statement is from the environmental campaigner um, Gus Beth, Speth, who once said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought with 30 years of good science we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation, and we scientists don't know how to do that. The second example is from Pope Francis, who stated in the latest encyclical on environmental degradation, Laudato Si, some tell us that ecological problems will solve themselves simply with the application of new technology and without any need for ethical considerations or deep change. Each age tends to have only a meager awareness of its own limitations. And here another more recent statement which expresses the importance of individuals, their beliefs and values um, that comes from the social climate movement and associated strikes. As the placard says, um, imagine what we can do if 7.7 billion people truly believe their action makes a difference. So now we have just looked at the shortfalls and gaps 
in current approaches towards sustainability, showing why the issues of inner dimensions and transformation have been receiving increasing attention in this field, um, which was our first question we wanted to look at. Um, but what can we do about it? So this was also the question that I asked myself in 2015 um, when I decided to establish the Contemplative Sustainable Futures Program at Luxus um, with the idea to create a new home, a new home for related scientific and educational advances. So right from the beginning, the declared aim was to create space and opportunities for learning, networking, knowledge development on the potential role of inner dimension and transformation for sustainability. And accordingly, the program consists of three building blocks encompassing education, networking, research uh, and research activities. So if you visit the program's website, which you can see here, um, and then if you scroll down, you will find the three building blocks, um, research, education, and networking. And if you then, for instance, click on education, um, you come to this page where you can find then detailed information regarding the content and outcomes of related activities. And one of the most important educational activity um, is our course on sustainability and inner transformation, um, which is part of our master's program on environmental science and sustainability, uh, environmental studies and sustainability science uh, called the Loomis program. Um, but we also have related PhD and postdoc education and our students have access to experimental learning and practice labs and more recently a transformative climate learning and reflection space um, which deals with the issue of inner dimensions and sustainability um, including issues such as climate anxiety. So um, you can also find more detailed information on the course on sustainability and inner transformation by scrolling down if you're interested and then you can find also here further down a description of our work on the assessment and the validation of our new teaching approaches, um, which aim to, as written here, offer so something that is more transformative for both students and teachers alike um, compared to traditional approaches. So when you then go to the um, program's building block on that focuses on research. You come to this page and there, if you scroll down, um, you will find all the different publications um, that have resulted from the program so far. And you will also find a description of current projects um, that are part of the program. And we don't have so much time here, um, so I only would like to mention that last year we received financing from the Swedish Research Council FORMUS um, to conduct two new research projects over the coming four years under the program. And the first one is called Agents of Change, Cognitive Bias and Decision Making in a Context of Social and Climate Change. And here we will look closely, uh, we will work closely with policy and decision makers um, in order to analyze what mindsets and associated learning processes are needed to support sustainable climate action and what is needed to enable such mindsets. The second project is called Transition Visions, coupling society, well-being and systems for transitioning to a fossil-free society. And in contrast to the first project, here we focus on the role of citizens. So the policy makers and decision makers by the role of uh, citizens um, as key agents of change for sustainability and climate action. And here we also look into what mindsets and associated learning processes can enable the transition to a fossil-free society. 
So when you click then on the third building block of the program, um, you come to this page. Uh, it relates to networking. And there, um, there's a de description of our collaborations and outreach activities, um, which include, for instance, close collaboration with Forward Malmö, um, a network organization here in Malmö of change agents working on sustainability issues. So, in some, the program has so far resu resulted in a range of different activities. Um, for education, it was the establishment of the master level course on sustainability, sustainability and inner transformation. Then PhD and postdoc education, different experiment learning and practice labs, and very recently, the mentioned transformative climate learning and reflection space. Um, for the research, um, the program has so far resulted in around 20 research studies and related frameworks for more integral approaches towards sustainability, research, um, education and um, practice. And we are just embarking on the two new research projects that I just presented. And finally, um, uh, in the of outreach and networking, we have established a professional knowledge database of stakeholders, networks, projects and sources of inner dimensions, sustainability, a newsletter and a range of new collaborations, including what I mentioned before, Forward Malmö and also the Swedish Parliament. So, if we look at all of the diverse research, education and working activities that so far have been conducted under the program, then five patterns or clusters of personal formative skills seem to be emerging. And that's work in progress. Um, but the first one is openness, self-awareness and reflection, which refers to the ability to meet situations, people, others and one's own thoughts and feelings with openness, presence, and acceptance. The second one is compassion and empathy, which relates to one's desire to see and meet oneself, others, and the world with care, humility, and in integrity. The third one is perspective seeking and relationality, um, it refers to the ability to seek and bring in more perspectives a broader, integral and relational understanding of oneself, others and the whole. Then there's agency, empowerment and sense-making. Um, that relates to the ability to see and understand the broad, broader and deeper patterns and our own role in the world we create together. And finally, courage and values-based engagement, and this relates to the ability to navigate oneself through the world based on insights into what is important and have the courage to act on them, on these insights or values. So before I would like, before I end, I would like to link these ideas back to the first part of the presentation and particularly the iceberg model. In fact, the described transformative skills, the list of five transformative skills which I just presented, inform our perspectives and specifically our view of ourselves, our mind and life, our society, nature and the world. Perspectives which ultimately underpin and inform our life choices, actions and interactions. And with this I would like to end by highlighting once again how important events like sensing nature from within are in helping us to reflect upon and engage together in new relationships um, with our world, ourselves and each other. Thank you. If I can just uh, ask a few quick questions. In, in delving into this uh, inner 
transformation uh, field. Have you had any insights about your own iceberg mm. that you yeah. can share, maybe? <laughs> I think there will be so many issues that it's difficult to say where to start. But as I mentioned before, when when we started working um, and establishing the course on sustainability and inter inner transformation, that was something which was also for me completely new because it's a com it creates a completely different. It's a co we are used to teaching something which is outside ourselves, but once you start something which relates to the inner dimensions, it's not possible to take you as a person out of the picture. So it becomes much more personal and it becomes more transformative for yourself as well. So, so yes, de definitively, definitively it um, has changed myself as well. I see it each time when we have these courses, it's something where we all learn from each other. So it's, uh, it, it's and, and what I mentioned before, we really want to break traditional approaches of teaching and come together and, and learn together in a, in a different way, which includes all our senses. Mm. And so everybody, unfortunately, can't take your course. <laughs> you can only teach so many people. What would you like the audience to do in order to have these same reflections or similar, at least, mm. that you have in the course? Mm. Again, it's a difficult question to ask. There are, like, many, many tools um, that aim at, for instance, connecting ourselves um, and realize our inner potential, our own values, and be able to act accordingly. So there's, there's not one approach or there's not one tool which I would like to like now say as that is the tool. I don't believe that that exists. And I think there are many questions marks right now that exist in what is actually effective and in what ways. So um, there, for instance, there's research on certain tools or approaches that are specifically helpful for uh, increasing perspective taking. There are other tools that are mostly relevant for increasing compassion towards others um, and the environment. And there are other also quite um, hands-on project tools which help us to link when we work on specific projects for sustainability, how we can actually these, what I said, personal, practical and political spheres of, of um, transformation. Because the point that I would like to make today is not to only focus on the inner. The point that I would like to make is that when we work on sustainability, we should not forget the inner. And this is what we have done um, for too long. We have forgotten about that aspect. And I think it's time to wake up and understand that more information is not the way to go. Um, not saying that we don't not need information, but we need to link it to addressing um, the hidden aspects, uh, which we cannot see. One final small question. As a political scientist, mm -hmm. I'm very curious about the cooperation with the Swedish parliament. <laughs> what, uh, what shape does that take? Yeah, um, it's related to, um, so we're just starting uh, embarking on that as well. But um, these, what I said, like one of the two projects um, is focused on policymakers, and that includes policymakers here in Malmö. It also includes policymakers at the national level in relation to, to the parliament. And um, we see more and more that people in practice also, they, they are really desperately looking for new ways how to work with sustainability, and they feel and they know they have to bring themselves um, to it, and they have to deal with climate anxiety. They have to deal with inner aspects of themselves and the people that they meet in their work. Um, and the parliamentarians are also part of them. And they have, like also here Mama City or other cities, they have started to um, establish different courses for personal development or adult development. And the big question mark is always, how does that actually have an impact on sustainability? at the societal level, at the systems level, and this is where we will work together with them. So watch this space is what you're saying. <laughs> what are, what are watch you? this space is what you're saying. There will be more coming from there the will be more coming, and there, should all yes. keep an eye on. Yes, and there, there are really a lot of question marks, and I invite everybody to join and, and, and work together on that. It's, it's a fascinating field, but it's uh, right now we cannot say that this tool makes exactly this and that translates into 
sustainability at a society level. But this is what we, are, we and many others have started to do and which is very exciting. Exciting. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, if you have questions that are specific to Christine's presentation, don't forget to write them down. You will have an opportunity to ask how many questions you want uh, later, just so you don't forget them. And now, Lena, are and you now, ready? Yes, I'm ready. Wonderful. <clears throat> Stage is yours. Can I get a better background? <laughs> Uh, because I'm going to stand here, I think. Yes. Um, I'd like to start off with a personal story about a moment that for me turned what was a pretty abstract, theoretical critique of civilization, you could say, into a very tangible personal experience. I have two kids, and when my daughter, the oldest of them, was... Uh, more or less newborn, I was looking for, in order not to have to sit at a playground all day, I was looking for activities that both interested me and that she could be a part of. And for some reason, what I landed uh, in was collecting edible plants. So me and my daughter spent her first two years or so as some sort of uh, modern day hunter-gatherers, um, her learning the names of garlic mustard, löktrav, and uh, chickweed, båtarv, uh, before she was probably able to say what her last name was. Um, <clears throat> anyway, when she was around three, we moved out to a small house in the countryside and we started growing our own food. And this is exactly where I got my insight, because what I had done the previous two years was to spend my time in a giving, plentiful nature without much competition. Wherever I looked, there was an abundance of things to smell and drink and eat and so on. So during these years, I would say that nature was very much um, a giving mother with me at her breast. Now, as an uh, unexperienced but optimistic uh, subsistence farmer, I was in a very different place. Uh, all the things that I used to eat, um, couch grass, nettle and lamb's quarters and ground elders and so on, when they now appeared, I would tear them away, swearing. And not to speak of the animals that I had earlier been happy to glimpse, uh, but that I now had to do everything to keep out of the gardens. So there were the wild boars, the deer, the moose, the hares, the voles, not to speak of the slugs and the whitefly and so on. So from a world of miracles, I had clearly moved into a world of vicious enemies. I'm a bit blinded by this, so I'll move over here. Uh, a bit later, I also got goats, and they were small kids uh, when they arrived to us. Just about the same time that a wolf started sneaking around our house, and also a family of lynx. This was during the winter, so I could see their footsteps. And then I got chickens, <laughs> which got me into a war with the goshawk, and also uh, a bit later a war with the fox, and also the marten, and I can add that I uh, ultimately lost uh, this war, uh, and the chicks as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I could go on, but what I'm trying to say here is that I, what I lived through uh, was, so to say, the agricultural revolution in miniature. And what I learned from this experience was several things, but I think most importantly, it made me realize the intimate interplay between practice and mythology, and most particularly that this, the influences between those two, between practice and mythology, very much runs both ways. I would say that we very often hear that we need new stories in order to reshape the way that we act in the world that in order to live sustainably, we need to formulate a new type of cultural mythology and one that acknowledges our vulnerability and our dependence and also acknowledges the subjectivity of other living beings. And this way of thinking is, of course, an expression of the insight that our ideas of the world uh, and our place in the world shape our actions. But I think we should also be clear that the opposite is at least as true, that is, our actions as a culture place very strict limits on the types of cultural mythologies that we can adopt. Let me take an example. Let's say that we today reformulate our idea of a pig. 
so that our understanding of it becomes that of an intelligent, sensitive, conscious subject that has intents and purposes and feelings of its own. Let's say we do that today. The question then becomes, what does that make a culture that castrates piglets without sedation, that cuts off their tails, that keeps them under grotesque conditions, and that kills and eats more than a billion of them per year? Or take another one. Let's say that we start understanding trees and forests as uh, communicative, purposeful entities. Into what would that make a culture like ours that practices mass slaughter of trees and their ecosystems in the form of large-scale industrial logging? So, to put it more clearly, the question is then, what would that make us? So the point is here, in other words, that so long as we consciously or subconsciously believe that our lives depend on the destructive practices of today, we won't be able to fully acknowledge them as destructive. Okay, so what I'm trying to do here today is to try to give at least the beginning of an answer to the following question. What dynamics have shaped our relation to nature and our idea of ourselves as something separate from nature? And the first preliminary is then, as I uh, just pointed to, the shift from a foraging to an agricultural way of life. And this is, of course, a shift that took on very different shapes and also had very different meanings uh, in the different places and during the different times that it first appeared in the world. And <clears throat> the established view of this uh, transition, a transition that is still to some extent really remains a mystery, but um, the established view is that it, in some cases it was voluntary, in some cases the foraging coexisted with the agriculture for a very long time, so you would sort of shift between the two depending on weather and, and other factors um, as a complement then. And in some cases it was forced, because of weather conditions, in other cases it was forced uh, from a foreign power and so on. But I'm convinced that regardless of the differing origins and histories, it is possible to make a few general observations that apply almost university, uh, universally once this system has been fully established. So let's start then with one of them, namely that basic concept, nature. And I believe that this idea that I, I was asked to explore today, the, that we humans are in some sense separate from our non-human surroundings, that idea is very much implicate in the world nature itself. Because when does such a word acquire meaning? Well, first of all, of course, when, when there is something other than nature, something that we feel the need to distinguish and delimit from something else. And that something else is, of course, human culture. But it's not a human culture that is intertwined with its natural surroundings, but rather one that has begun to reconstruct the world, to build its own word, a world to, in some sense, take nature's place. And this, I would say, is civilized culture in its most basic form, in the most basic sense of the world, because the, uh, in the, uh, the most basic sense of the word, because the original meaning of the word civilization comes from the word for city. So a civilization is um, very literally a city building culture. A culture then not immersed in its natural surroundings, but rather striving to create its own universe. And also, I would say, in modern times, the city is a very potent symbol for this, a human cons construct that is, in some sense, an embodiment of the cultural idea that everything in the world is made by humans and exists to serve human purposes. So, we have one meaning of the word nature that serves as a negative definition of its opposite, namely culture. And perhaps, as I said, this is the most fundamental meaning of the word. And in, in the same connotation, we also have the word wilderness, which not only denotes an outside, but also a threatening and dangerous outside. And I would say that the word nature, taken in this, con uh, taken in this specific context, has become increasingly abstract during the last maybe century or so, 
because if, if it's always been an abstraction, then it started out as an abstraction with concrete instances that most people had a relation to, the wolf, the fish, the stream, the wood, and so on. It was an abstraction with a face, so to speak. But increasingly, many of us has, have lost the relation to the specific places and phenomena and beings that were that are carriers of nature, so that only the abstraction remains, emptied of association to the unique singular forms of life that fill it. And with only this sort of threatening association left. But there is, of course, also a more prosaic, um, neutral meaning of the word nature, which is, so to say, nature that has yet to be transformed into something meaningful by human hands. That's another meaning of nature. And this way of seeing turns nature into a commodity storage or a, a collection of raw materials, a basis for human wealth, but definitely not equal to human wealth. Because by human wealth, we understand not clean water, not breathable air. By human wealth, we understand the products and the energy that the water, air and soil, so on, can enable us to produce. And if there's one central idea that signifies the entire agricultural project, and the culture that has uh, given rise to it, as well as sprung from it, I would say that that is the concept of control. And to me, uh, the concept of control is relevant there on many levels, not least because the idea of control is something that I've struggled with and I say continue to struggle with in my personal life. But also I think that control is a deeply paradoxical concept. If we look uh, go back to the, trans the transition to an agricultural way of life, it seems on a first glance that this transition uh, increased human control. Food was grown in a specific spot that could be protected and food could be stored in a dry, clean place and a certain surplus was made possible and the whole process of feeding was made more predictable and so on. But interestingly, the effect seems to largely have been the opposite. The radical decrease in the number, number of plants used, for example, from hundreds to tens, gave, right, uh, gave rise to a much larger vulnerability in relation to drought and flooding and so on. Serious famine got more common as well as nutritional deficiencies. And of course, what I said about growing spots that could be protected and the food supplies that could be stored, the need for storage and protection is, of course, in itself a form of vulnerability. So I think there really is a parallel to the personal level here, where control indefinitely lead, needs to, uh, leads to the need for more control and the extremely rapid growth of te technology that we see today, for example, is only another sign of this. And another side of all this is that we come to believe, and in some sense I think we are right to do so, we come to believe that our lives depend on upholding this control to the extent that we forget all the other living things that our lives depend on that are not possible to control. Which of course also affects what I would call our political loyalties. Take for example a city where everything in our surroundings indicate that our lives depend on industrial and economic infrastructure. Our lives, everything in my experience tells me that my life depends on water in the tap. It doesn't depend on enough rain in the summer, for example. Or my life depends on transport to the supermarket, not healthy soils in the fields. And I think that with this direct experience, it's very hard to, with some conviction, act on something different. And I spoke initially, initially about how our ideas about non-human nature are shaped by our actions, that we, once we enter into an exploitative relationship with our surroundings, we also tend to underpin this um, exploitative relation with an ideology that makes the non-human world out to be non-thinking, non-feeling, maybe even non-living, and generally without intrinsic value or meaning. But if we are once again to go back to the consequences on a personal level uh, of the way of relating to the world that has dominated, say, the last 10,000 years or so, 
I think there are several more consequences on a personal level and also ones that act on a very deep psychological level. Um, I have uh, in my writing been very interested in the idea of the child and how a lot of um, a lot of our cultural understanding becomes very manifest in the area of um, in the area of child uh, children and childcare more manifest than in ed any other area really. But I've also come to see parenthood as maybe the most uh, political practice that exists, really. That is, what we do when we take care of a small child is in a very tangible sense to teach it what to expect of the world, what the world is like, and in essence, uh, really, what it means to be human. And something that is very clear is that precisely the con uh, conditions of parenthood went through a radical change as a consequence of the transition from a nomadic foraging way of life to a sedentary one of farming and animal keeping. One effect is that nativity went up, which um, is of course a problem in itself, um, <laughs> at least today, uh, so that children were born much closer together. Uh, another one is that men became more absent and women uh, more overloaded with work. The almost um, constant skin-to-skin -skin contact that is part of normal ch uh, child care among hunter-gatherers tended to disappear and children were no longer carried around. And children were also expected to contribute to work from a much earlier age. But there were, I believe, on a much more fundamental level also consequences having to do wi uh, with what I would call uh, models for maturity. Uh, what types of orders and interactions were visible to the child? What metaphors came naturally? What type of community presented itself to the child? If uh, children during the vast part of human history came into contact with wild species and the intricate relations between them, and also to a community of humans involved in interactions with these species, the child in the farm came into contact with a much more closed world, populated by, I would say, infantilized creatures over which humans exerted complete control. And the point is, I think, that every child is very alert as to what is expected of it, what it means to grow up, and what the goal is of this growing up, and what examples present itself to the child, I think, really does make a difference on a mostly, probably, subconscious plane. And I would say that we today have taken this process even further so that the child is presented not only with a somewhat mechanized and reduced human context, but a context from which the human has been removed and only mechanization and reduction remains. One of the most prominent features of modern childcare is that the idea of maturity is synonymous with independence, or rather, the transfer of dependence from living unto non-living things. It is, for example, considered more mature to suck on a pacifier than to suck on your mother's breast. And it's considered more mature to sleep alone with a teddy bear than to sleep with your parents, and so on. And this, I think, is really only the end point of a successive cultural movement away from the uncontrollable that is to say, away uh, from the living, towards the fully controllable, that is to say, the dead. And this to me is genuinely worrying, really, that in a time when we more than ever would need the capacity to perceive and respond actively to the living, we are fostering our children uh, and ourselves into a technological culture that, um, to a more and more extreme extent, encourages us to um, invest emotionally in non-living things. And so, going back to the question of how to best understand the word nature, I believe that we must acknowledge, acknowledge it as a word that always points both, both inward and outward. That is, nature, if it carries in itself an idea of separation, then it's also an idea um, of the possibility to separate or negate or deny something inside of ourselves. And going back to the culture template uh, wilderness, I would say that it's very clear that the fear of the wild throughout history has been the fear of uh, ourselves giving in to the wild, really, which of course is evident in all types of folklore and, and popular culture. 
but also in the ideas about human nature uh, that is put forward in a more uh, serious uh, political context today. And to me, it's clear that a certain idea of human nature is more or less implicit in almost every discussion about the future and the challenges of humanity today. In fact, it's an integral part of the narrative of progress that still colors very much of our cultural debate. We like to believe, for example, that war has always existed, that women have always been raped and abused, that humans have always destroyed the land they live on, because how are we otherwise to explain that every civilized culture has given rise to, uh, to these things? Ironically, the idea of some sort of Hobbesian state of nature is, is used both to justify the continued civilizing projects, so to speak, in the form of technology, in order to get rid of these human atrocities at any cost. But it's also used to justify and explain the fact that these civilized ultra-technological societies in no way seem to be able to get rid of them. I would, uh, as a final thing, uh, like to take a look at a certain word that I think carries with it both a lot of the problems that we face and also an indication of what would be needed um, to change. That word is listening. And I think it also very much carried with it, it carries with it the, so to say, uh, double nature <laughs> of the word nature that I've tried to indicate. Because um, what does it mean to listen? I've uh, recently read a lot about so-called social robots, um, among them machines that are supposed to listen to children reading at libraries, for example, or offering um, children in need therapeutic support, or participating in conversation with older people that would otherwise feel alone. Um, and what these machines offer is, of course, only the performance of listening. They're not able to listen because listening is something that requires an insight <laughs> that can reverberate and let itself be moved by what is uttered. Because, it's, um, because this, <laughs> this insight is in some way able to recognize its own experience in the others and also recognize the other in itself. And I believe that in order to listen to nature in this deep sense, there is also something within ourselves that we need to start listening to. Something that is deeply natural uh, in maybe the most meaningful sense of the, world, of the word natural, meaning non-constructed, non-designed, and also non-controllable. And such a listening is, uh, as I've tried to make clear, definitely not a solution. But in its absence, uh, I'm sure that any solution would really not be a solution at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Ah, this was what you were... Wanting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for a great presentation. When, when nature is becoming more weird, unpredictable, mm -hmm. uh, uncanny, do you think that will change this scheme that you're describing? It, it might change it or it might reinforce it, right? Because we have this idea of nature. We have so many... Um, I think we have several ideas of nature that are sort of working within us without us really noticing because they, uh, the, the culture is so imbued by them in some sense. But this um, nature with a vengeance, so to speak, is uh, definitely one of those cultural ideas of nature. So in some sense, I mean, maybe just as well, I think we have a choice to make here because just as well this nature becoming uncanny could reinforce this human's war against nature that we need to not sort of <laughs> let the walls fall but rather reinforce them in order to protect us uh, ourselves and also uh, um, i think it's a consequence maybe even more intensely than we already do constructing a world from just human artifacts because i see that this is really a parallel movement the the natural world and uh, the natural world deteriorating uh, because of our actions, but also us being more and more 
uh, going deeply, more deeply and deeply into word, uh, worlds that we have constructed for ourselves, with the virtual being sort of the end point of this. I mean, many children nowadays are growing up without maybe even visiting what we would call nature, forests, mm. oceans, uh, these natural environments. Mm. How do you think that impacts? Can we still connect to that inner nature of ourselves without external nature if we only surround ourselves with cities? Mm. I think it's very, very, very hard and challenging. I, I, I don't think that this ability is ever really lost within a human being. But I also think that there is a very uh, important distinction between nature on one hand and environment or biological diversity. And we have all these abstract words uh, on the other hand, because I mean, I think most people today are able to sort of almost without thinking uh, tell you why biological diversity is important or why it's important to fight climate change. But then you ask them for uh, about the difference between, um, a, what's the word in English? Kaja och kråka. I mean, you ask them for the name of a bird and they won't be able to answer. And I think that, I mean, the for me, uh, when are you willing to really act on something, even if it costs you? I would say that maybe the only reason that you ever act on anything, uh, even if it costs you, is um, love or, or a strong feeling like that. And you can't love uh, the environment. You can't love the climate. You can love a specific place specific animal, a specific other human being. And that, if that is lacking, if the relation to the specific singular instances of nature is lacking, then I think that, um, just as you said, the environment, this abstraction will never make us act in itself. Interesting. Right. So yeah. focus on these places that we can uh, have a relationship uh, with. That you can experience with your senses and in that way build a, build a relation to, yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. We'll come back to this uh, later. Thanks. And now uh, Diego will hold the final presentation uh, of the day. Not yet. Um, an inspirational talk, both of you. Thank you so much. This has been really incredible. And um, I wanted to thanks again, um, Moderna, for having us and, and all these really inspiring exhibition here and everybody for coming out today and, and listen to us. Uh, I think this is really one of the central conversations and so, so great to have this space for, for us to come together and discuss these topics. Um, so thanks again, Joa and Linnea, for, for bringing us together. So my name is Diego Galafassi and um, basically <laughs> I think my, my key point that I wanted to, to do here with this presentation is to say that the arts has an incredible role to play in these transitions that we are experiencing and perhaps should be leading uh, much before you know all the technocratic solutions that we have out there. Perhaps the arts is the place that should be leading these conversations. And uh, I'm going to speak uh, both from a sort of a scientific uh, side of my practice and from an artistic side of my practice, which I always have a difficulty presenting myself because I, I work at uh, L Luxus at with Lund University. I have a project there called Arts for Transformations. But I'll, I'm also an artist. I've been uh, working within uh, media, um, cinema, and I've been doing performances, I've been working with climate futures, translating that into food experiences, working with installations. So I've been really going across a, a, a whole range of practices, but I think really what I've been trying to do is to find a path that really address these really profound questions that both of you brought up uh, and brings that into conversation in, in with the wide society. So I, I, I did a PhD uh, at the Stockholm Resilience Center um, called the Transformative Imagination. And I've been thinking about the ways in which we, my work relates to 
the wonder and the, the beauty of, of this place that we live, this home that we inhabit, but also from an understanding that the times in which we're living have a profound, uh, they are significantly different. Th there's a whole history to it, to where we, we got where we got. But today, if you look around the planet, this is how it looks like. And scientists, as you all know, have come up with this term called the Anthropocene, which is the age where human activity is the predominant force uh, shaping the planet and all its, its, its current dynamics. My colleagues uh, from the environmental sciences, they usually s uh, show this uh, graph showing how the temperatures of the planet have fluctuated across history and then uh, in the last 10,000 years where the history that Helena just to uh, uh, talked to us about uh, takes place really in a, in a quite remarkable, uh, stable uh, place here. Um, but we are, if you look at the any graph that you might look from uh, uh, carbon dioxide to number of restaurants, anything that you look at has this particular shape, the uh, rocket stick, so it, it really shows that we are living in periods of tremendous acceleration. A and this is sort of the background and how the scientists like to talk about this problem. Um, but I in my work in, in, in the many people that I've been working with, uh, we start from the point that we are actually in a process where we are waking up to a planet that is alive. It, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's showing that it is not just some kind of inert matter out there that we are affecting and creating all of these changes, but it is alive. And so how do we actually reassess our place in this um, uh, great planet that we live in? And, and uh, Amitav Ghosh wrote this book called The Great Derangement, saying that uh, while the climate crisis is, is perhaps most uh, essentially a crisis of culture and therefore a crisis of imagination. So um, again, th this is kind of the starting point where how can we think about these big challenges that we're facing, not as a just something that is out there uh, in the world that we have to go out and create solutions and fix it as, I as if it was a technical problem, but rather as a cultural issue. And this is where the work that we, we've been talking about is so central and that's why I'm, I'm so excited to be here, part of this uh, this program that I think has really uh, given the space to, to, to these important conversations. I, I was hosting a, a, a workshop and, and a talk uh, earlier, well, late last year uh, at the Moderna Museum as well in Stockholm. Uh, it was called the Transformative Imagination and we had Karen O'Brien, um, who's a climate scientist working a lot uh, with uh, inner transformations, as Christine was explaining. Tim Ingold is an anthropologist. Verka Serlin is, uh, is also a, a historian uh, from Stockholm. And, and we were precisely discussing these ideas about how perhaps imagination is a place where both the sciences and the arts can actually come together to explore how do we actually reimagine the world we live in. So from, from here on, uh, I wanted to just show a, a few concrete examples of the work that I've been doing and, and show some clips to, and kind of like walk you through the ways in which I've been thinking about this and the ways in which I've been um, working with different kinds of forms of art and, and then bring it back to, to the project that we have in Luxus at the moment, looking more generally and broadly about the role of the arts. So the first example here is uh, Charismatic Megafauna, is a film that came out um, late last year. Um, it's a UNESCO patronage film uh, with live music condu conducted by Ezapeka Salonen. And here the idea of this film was really how can we create an experience, a cinematic experience, uh, without any words, it's just images and music um, and and create, rather than a representation of all of these big Anthropocene challenges, rather create a space where you can take a step back and contemplate. As Christine was saying, the, the capacity to actually reflect on our own assumptions is something that is it's actually very, very difficult. So how can perhaps a, a, um, a, an art form as music or, or a, a visual experience can perhaps allow that space? So I'm just gonna play one little clip that shows uh, kind of the cinematic approach that we use for that.
Anyways, it go, it, it's a feature film, so imagine an experience like this for uh, an hour or something. So the, uh, one of the key reactions that we often get is people say, well, how boring, right? It takes so long to do these images, but actually it's by design. So in the research uh, of this film, we've re we, we actually looked at the history of cinema, and we realized that the, 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 s the length of cuts in a film has uh, over their history has gone from, say, 10 seconds early on to now perhaps uh, two seconds. So when you watch something on TV, you'll see that the cuts are really, really short. And that, in a sense, creates a sense of fragmentation and the world moving so fast. So we actually tried to reverse that and create a, a film that has these, uh, maybe every, if every shot that you see here has like 45 seconds or a minute. And that, in a, in a way, it's about also moving the, the audience or your participation from watching an image out there to actually realizing what is happening within you as you watch this and your reactions. It's, uh, it's about giving you that space and time so that you con con can contemplate your own relationship to these images. That might be sometimes you might get angry, sometimes you might get bored, and all of that is an important part of that. So this is one example. The second one is a film that we're working right now. So I'm just going to say that this is the. Uh, I'm going to show a clip that it, the the film is not uh, out yet. So it's um, um, the film is called The Life of Lines, and it precisely tries to do a reflection on um, on what are these fundamental assumptions that we have in society. What is this word nature? Why does just the word nature actually separates us from that? And are there ways from uh, indigenous ways or from just you know traditional uh, um, uh, cosmologies that actually can help us navigate and reimagine the way in which our mainstream culture has? So I'm gonna play um, a quick sample Let of this Let us start one. with a world that is everything and not say we get to everything by adding up all particular things. We start with everything. And then we see how every particular thing is just a particular fold in this everything. Asking philosophical questions are questions about about what it means to live, to know, to remember, to exist, to learn, to find one's way around. What he's trying to do in his work is reintroduce people to an awareness of what it means to actually be in a place. Overall, the world has become a better place, that we're living longer, that we're living more comfortably, and most of us are. And been in debates where people have pointed to out the window and said, look at all those buildings, look at all those cars, look at those aeroplanes in the sky, look at our life today, look how long we're living. And, and you want to deny progress? You say, look, this is progress. And what is this progress based on? Science. And what is science based on? Objective understanding of, of, of the world and how it works. And you're not to question any of that. Conventionally, perception and, in fact, all experience is divided into a self on the inside and an object or world on the outside. And this belief underpins our entire world culture. It underpins the way we think, feel, act, perceive, and relate. It's the idea of a conversation in which in which the world is something that we, we have to be creating all the time through dialogue with one another and learning from one another. Um, and, um, and that means we have to take other people seriously and if we don't agree with them, argue with them, but not to say, oh, you hold these views because you're part of this culture. That's not to take them seriously. Forging a conversation that would be unlimited, that would involve everybody. Through that conversation, try and figure out the best way to live. 
how we can have a world that has room for everything, not only now, but in the indefinite future. So the film is, is not out, it, it, it's, um, it's in post-production at the moment, but um, the idea there, it connects very much also to Helene's presentation here uh, on, on exploring the ways in which uh, these assumptions that we, we're not even aware Let of. Let us start uh, with the world. Uh, for example, that there is a world out there and we are uh, perceive ourselves as separate from that. And what does that actually mean? So, so the film goes through that. So uh, my final example is a project that just came out uh, last month. It's called Breathe. Uh, and this is an augmented reality project um, where you basically uh, you put on these goggles. So here the attempt is how can we use these emerging technologies of augmented reality to actually help us to connect to that wild part of ourselves. Uh, and in this project is about the, the atmosphere. And so the realization that we, we do live our lives immersed in an atmosphere. It's like we're swimming around in this ocean of air and we don't realize that I, if you take, if you just take a, a, a breath now and you exhale, the molecules that were inside of you, they will travel across the planet in just about two years. So there's this really interesting connection between the very personal and intimate, but also the planetary. And air is it's such an interesting platform to tell stories about the ways in which we are uh, all inhabiting this one single uh, um, world. And uh, this is uh, the installation. So you arrive here, uh, like I said, you put on these goggles that, that you can still see your world, but you, you also see digital elements. And basically, the project is a visualization of the air and how that uh, how your life is so deeply entwined with the life of everybody else. So you go in with four other people, and and you have this shared storytelling. Uh, you can visualize uh, your breathing. Uh, you can touch it and move it around and you can see how the air you are actually breathing right now has been created by a living world uh, and it's not something that is it's out there um, it's um, it's a what we call location aware um, exit installation so wherever it plays it is bringing environmental data about the the currents of air there are in that particular place and so on and so here's again uh, like how can we perhaps uh, harness the power that we have of these technologies to actually help us to reconnect or to be aware and sensitive to to the world that we live in because it's not the environment is not something out there is is something that we are immersed on so just to play a little clip about it so you can see some of the visuals when you there. sing when you speak when you breathe you join the life of the atmosphere with every breath you renew your belonging to a vast living atmosphere So here again, we uh, you you kind of seeing the, the the red thread here. here the 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 idea is uh, how can perhaps using the atmosphere or the air as a as a as part of a story, how can we actually question that idea that there is a world that we are separate from um, when our lives are so deeply entwined with that. Okay, so these were uh, some concrete examples of works that we've been working in. This is the part of where I wanted to to tell you a little bit about the project we have in here at Luxus. Uh, it's called Arts for Transformation. And basically, th uh, the work that we've been doing, it, it sits in a whole ecosystem of so many projects out there. And uh, literally, there are f thousands of, of new projects uh, that just came out last year uh, you know, with uh, around climate or environmental questions. And uh, we did a, uh, um, an article just in 2018 looking at climate arts in particular as a field. And this is kind of like how many projects we found. It's like 55 in 2015, 52. And if you would do it this same study now, you'll see this huge increase. So it's really becoming a, a, a very uh, big field uh, of practice. Um, and in this project, we, we have been interviewing lots of different artists. These are some of the names that we've been talking to and exploring what, is, what, what role has the arts to play in uh, realizing the sustainable development goals, but more broadly in achieving these uh, profound transformations that we are talking about here. Um, 
so some of the um, we are writing up the the material, but some of the key uh, words that come up in these conversations are these three ones, and I'm just going to walk you through what this means. So a lot of uh, these artists and and project leaders they they talk about the arts as a as a way for achieving profound insights, and that means uh, as creating new kinds of perceptions about the world, what the world is, and how we relate to it. It is also uh, about achieving insights in the ways we feel about different things and the way we experience or remember uh, things. So insight is a, is a very central theme on the role of the arts. The second, well, uh, to say that uh, art really is based on, is not necessarily about, um, you know, some kind of fact out there, but it's, it's really trust this your experience as this uh, place where these insights can appear. So one of the examples here um, is the work of Christian Simonetti, working with concrete and, and really exp exploring the materiality of concrete and its history by actually making concrete. So really in th through his experience, he has developed a project that really brings very profound insights on this material that is so ubiquitous in our society and, and what does that actually mean to live our lives in a concrete world. Um, or if think about the work of Olaf Eliasson, uh, it's one thing to you know understand about the climate and the impacts in the Arctic. The other thing is, the other is to have your own experience of feeling the 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 ice melting under your fingers, uh, and so on and so forth. This is in Jairo Kolundu, who works with song as a uh, as a learning tool in South Africa. And it continues. This, the second big area that uh, artists are talking about is the role of uh, in the imagination. It's really the arts as these space that can open up and free our imaginations and 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 help us not only project a future out there, but actually realize w uh, what what do we want to be? What kind of world do we want to go in? What are the, the perhaps the potential futures that already exist today, and that we want to nurture and, and grow and so on. Um, so here there's a lot of work in, in, uh, in science fiction and uh, uh, the work of uh, Vanessa Andreotti in Canada looking at decolonial futures. So how do you decolonize the imagination of the future so that we don't keep replicating the same patterns and the same kinds of dynamics of exploitation that have uh, entrenched the ways in which we imagine the future. Um, the final big theme that I wanted to point out is this idea of attunement. And and again, it's interesting. Lena brought us this idea of of listening, and and I think a lot of the artists are, are telling uh, about the role of the arts as a pl place where we can learn how to listen and how to pay attention to what is happening around us, and pay attention to our uh, place in what is happening, um, and also finding. Uh, in a way, finding ways to communicate beyond our symbols and, and language that that we use to to talk about these issues. Um, thinking here about the work of Tomas Saraceno, the Aerocene, who created these air sculptures that help us to again get in contact with uh, this um, fl a world of fluxes and, and flows in the atmosphere. Uh, the work of Natalie Jeremijenko, uh, putting sensors in the Hudson River that can send you tweets if there's a fish under the water. So it's really about creating this connection with what what's happening underwater. Well, we already spoke about the the work on on the atmosphere. Um, so I don't know why this is going back and repeating, but when you uh, this is where we are. So yes. So we, we this these are the sort of the key themes that are emerging in these uh, dozens of interviews that we've been doing with artists around the world. And one of the key things that we are very interested in to explore uh, in this project also it's how can the arts better contribute then to these transformations? Are there profound uh, transformations that need to happen within the arts? Say it in education, in, in terms of festivals, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, uh, institutions, and and how do we actually empower that? So um, some of the of these issues that have come up is this idea of inclusion. The arts tends to be uh, fragmented and, and perhaps focused historically in some groups. So how do we actually open up uh, these spaces uh, by providing new platforms of funding? Uh, thinking about also standards of art and, and maybe how those standards are shifting once we actually start incorporating mu new languages. Um, the a lot of people have mentioned that the the art school curricula is still quite disconnected from these global challenges. So how do we start infusing that uh, into art education? 
Um, and perhaps art is not yet widely uh, incorporated in spaces of power, say in, in, in urban planning or, or political processes. Um, so I'll just keep through. These are some examples of uh, of uh, things that are already happening that, that mitigate some of these challenges. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out is also perhaps how do we work with emergent forms of art? Um, because historically we know that once the, 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 the tube was created, then finally artists could actually go and paint out there. So maybe there's something about these new forms of art like emergent media that have some qualities that are really interesting here for the kinds of changes that we're talking about. Because it tends to be very interactive, participatory, it tends to be focused on presence and people being in, in a particular space. So perhaps there's something to do, uh, th th there could be some potential in these uh, types of, of work. Uh, this is a work of uh, indigenous communities in Canada working with virtual reality to actually express their own perspective on the world and the, way the ways in which they are imagining the future. So really what I'm trying to point out here is that perhaps when there's a new form of art emerging, there's a possibility to ban those kinds of um, uh, art spaces to, to something that really addresses the challenge that we're facing. This is another example of a, a team that has created a virtual reality um, experience where you can actually see from the perspective of a bee. So you are in that forest and you can have your own perspective on the forest, but if you put on these goggles, you could actually see how the bee is seeing or the frog and there are different animals. So it's this idea of like um, entering different perspectives and really using uh, technology as a, a portal for that. Um, okay, just to wrap up, I wanted to say basically that art has this crucial role to create the cultural conditions in which transformations are possible. So it's not transformations and not necessarily something that we need to go out there and implement, but actually it's about creating the conditions on which they can simply emerge. Not simply, but they, they emerge. And artists, in their own practices, they are developing some very critical capacities, in my opinion, uh, for these transformative processes. Uh, the idea of dealing with ambiguity, d the idea of uh, dealing with emotions and bringing in emotions into these processes, or the idea of, of uh, being reflexive about our own assumptions. All of these are things that artists are already doing in their practice. And I think they have a really key role to play here. And then the final final question is, wh what, are, what are the possibilities within these emergent art forms uh, to support these transformations? So I wanted to, s to just conclude with something that happened this year, uh, the past year that was quite interesting. I, I was at, at the Transformations Conference and the organizers, they had asked um, the, the children from different schools in Santiago to paint their vision of the future. And basically I s just selected one here. It says, todos mueren, uh, everybody dies. And uh, basically 85% of the pictures that the kids drew were like that. And to me that was really striking because I don't think that even five years ago that was the case. Um, and what I walked out uh, from that experience of is that I think our children's imagination it's really a really good indicator for how much progress we are doing in terms of creating a future that is sustainable for everybody. If our kids are imagining the future like this, then we surely have to do something different. So I, I wanted to invite everyone to think about, uh, you know, how can we use perhaps our children's imagination as our barometer for the work that we're doing so that we really re-enchant that sense of wonder to the planet that we inhabit. So this is where I will end, and then I look forward to, you know, talk to all of you. There's so many interesting questions emerging. Thanks. Thanks so much, Diego. Thank you. That Sorry for the rush. It was quite rushed. Oh, no, it's okay. That last image was truly horrifying, but it's true. When you talk to children nowadays, there's basically no hopeful images of the future. Um, as someone who also works at the university and you sit on both chairs, how could we as researchers looking at these issues of climate, environment, sustainability, incorporate the arts in a way that benefits both practices? Yeah, I think a lot has to do with uh, understanding that there's so much um, knowledge and, and understanding and and practice within the arts that has been already doing a lot of the work that the scientists are 
trying to start to do. So I think understanding each other's world is, is so important and creating language to, to, to do that. I think sometimes the, the issue of standards is also very difficult because the, the standards of quality and so on are very different for the different fields. So I think really uh, reaching out to the arts, not as a way to like, how can I get some representation or some illustration from what I'm doing, but actually opening up your own research to s to something that you might not even expect that might come out of it. So I think it's it's really about openness and and being uh, in that sense considerate to each other's practice. Yeah. That will be a, a starting place. Yeah, I know because when we've co cooperated with artists, it's usually end up in the situation where the funder wants us right. to somehow measure how much impact this artwork had. Yes, and then you take that to the artist, and that's a really odd conversation to have. Uh, because usually that impact is measured in, yeah. in different ways. Some of these things we could really uh, right. work Right, and on. I think you're right. And in, in a lot of, in these interviews, one of the questions is really about impact and whether, what is the thinking around impact from the artist's perspective. And, and there's, you would be surprised, but I think a lot of the artists are interested in that question too. Like, is my work having any impact out there? How can we actually develop ways? So I think actually there's a really productive space of, of trying to move towards finding ways to understand impact. And the impact will look very, diff you know, it, we cannot look for what we are expecting to find in terms of like numbers and so on, but there, the, I'm sure that there are ways to find out what is, uh, you know, how, wh what is happening. And there's quite a lot of work happening in the UK. I know an organization called Julie's Bicycle that has been doing a lot of work in that space and trying to understand the impact of the arts and, and, and how that has been changing things over several years. Yeah. I mean, we, we created this museum from the future, which is a uh, museum that's set in a future where we have actually succeeded with our climate targets. We have stabilized at 1.5 degrees and we cooperated with an artist to make that experience. And then we promptly had to <laughs> evaluate the impact. And so we started talking to people who had seen it, who had hosted it. And one interesting thing that came out of it that was that it wasn't as much the experience or like with the information itself, but it was the method, the artistic method and that way it created a space for imagination that they took home. So right. municipalities and decision makers and companies, they said that they took that home and are now using that in when they talk about the future of their own organizations. But I think we really are, in the coming years, we'll find out that Interesting. More. Yeah, great. All right, we will soon come back to the discussion with all three of you. But first, I just wanted you to stand up, firstly, because we've been sitting down for one and a half hours. And take this time to really consider the things you've heard here the last one and a half hours. What do you take home to yourselves about your own inner transformation? Is there something you can learn and work with? And I'd like you to just take a few minutes now while we set up and prepare uh, to talk to the person next to you, preferably it's someone you don't know. So if you can turn the other way around, please do, about these issues. And We'll come back in a few minutes. All right. <laughs> dear, uh, dear guests, it's good to see that you have plenty to discuss. Uh, hopefully, you have collected a lot of questions within these discussions that you now want to ask our presenters. Uh, we started discussing ourselves uh, instead. <laughs> and you were right in the middle of an amazing quote. Oh, the amazing quote. Yes, <laughs> Shall you repeat please it? share that yes, amazing I quote. Was, um, I was quoting the um, writer Derek Jensen, uh, who in, I think that maybe the beginning line of one of his books is, every morning when I wake up, I ask, myself, I ask myself if I should write or blow up a dam. And, and I was quoting him because I was uh, more or less saying that I'm asking myself the same question. Or I mean, you can talk about art and science and the interplay and how you can use, but I think at some point you come to, as an artist or writer, you come to ask yourself, and maybe also as a scientist, you come to ask yourself, what difference does it make? I mean, does it all stay in this abstract sphere? Am I actually, <laughs> it's prohibiting someone from dying by doing this, or am I not? And I think that's really the relevant question that you should come back to. But it's also a very discouraging question sometimes, because you're not, you're not making a difference in this very concrete, 
sense of an, an animal living or dying, for example, or uh, carbon dioxide being emitted or not being emitted or so. So uh, that was the quote, <laughs> yes. Interesting reflections. Do you have any other reflections before we take questions from the audience uh, relating to each other's presentations? The only thing that I mentioned just to you when you asked me um, about my reflection was that um, I just found that both Diego's examples from art and your examples from art as a writer um, were just so perfect illustrations of how it's so crucial to help us um, challenge our assumptions. So coming back to the iceberg model, I think it, they both, both of you, you gave just perfect examples of how powerful art can be to really um, ask ourselves the important questions. And also coming back to this, I, I show these two circles with the sustainability community and the consciousness community and how powerful art can also be of to bring these two communities together by working with artists. I found that really, I'm really happy to, to have seen both of your presentations. Okay. I think the, um, the iceberg image was very interesting because maybe as an illustration of all this, because I was so absorbed by the iceberg itself. You were symbolizing something and I was like, wow, <laughs> look at that iceberg. And I think maybe that's a hopeful thing. Mm. Focusing on the iceberg is sort of the uh, clone. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and the central point. Yes. Yes. There were two other things that when when now you presented, like you showed the three aspects, insight, attunement, imagination, um, and then you had these other terms next to them, and in a way these were the terms that showed up in these five transformative skills that I listed mm -hmm. quite, there was quite mm -hmm. some overlap, and you also you mentioned love yeah. and caring, yeah, which, which yeah. was very much related to these transformative skills, and you both mentioned listening, and before you asked me about the tools that if one could um, explore oneself uh, in in this field, and I didn't mention it, but one of them is also the, these tools for deep t deep listening and for um, getting into real conversations with others. Mm -hmm. um, and similar to the person in the movie who said that that we have to accept the other person and listen deeply and accept them as who they are or what they are. And um, so I found these uh, all these um, interlinkages, which um, yeah, are exciting to, to see how, how we come from so many different directions, but we come to similar conclusions. I think that's very motivating as well. Mm -hmm. I think maybe, can I uh, pose a question? Mm -hmm. uh, in, um, in relation to listening, because I just uh, recently read a book, which is not really new, but by the um, technology sociologist, you could say, Sherry Turkle, American psychologist from the beginning. Um, it's called something like the end of conversation, I think. But she's looking at case studies and how uh, technology affects like, the dialogue between mm. people in families and at workplaces and so on. And what she's finding, her very clear finding, um, both statistically and also in these deep uh, studies, is that people are not having conversations in the deep meaning anymore. So mm. I, my question would then be, do you see around you a tendency towards conversation? Mm. Like in, in line with what you're visioning, mm. or do you also see the, uh, the opposite? Yeah, I would say I also see a lot of fragmentation and lack of real listening, which relates also to the images that you said we get so used to, you know, these quick images. Uh, mm. We cannot actually listen anymore for a long period of time mm. to anybody or to ourselves. Um, and um, that's probably not directly related to your question, but I was just it remind me because you mentioned uh, listening and technology mm. um, that I know that there, there is more and more research on it as well, and they say that only if you have a mobile phone listening on the table, yeah, it affects no, uh, nobody, the conversation. Yes, just, yeah. so nobody actually using it uh, affects the quality of the conversation, the depth of the communication, which is very much related to that. And perhaps it relates also a bit to what I said before, that we want to try to change the... Um, approach in teaching where nowadays also the students sit there with the laptop with the iphone all the electronic devices next to them and 
And students get now, they're quite irritated when you ask them to put away all the devices because we want to actually listen to each other and get insights from each other. And in my la last course that I had on sustainability in, in a transformation, um, we had a round and then I asked them about insights. And then the first reaction from the students was that, um, sorry, but what do you mean with insights? Um, and I think that's very typical for where we went, came to in teaching, because we are just basically used of getting knowledge. And then if somebody asks a question, just repeating knowledge. Mm -hmm. But there's no really working with that knowledge and really getting trying to get deeper and transform the knowledge it, and then come yeah. to personal reflections and personal insights, which then would be transformative for your own life. Um, and they are, there's also like horizontal vertical learning or teaching, which, which relates to that um, conversation. Can I just say one thing? I think that also in the project we are asking this question, so how can the work of the arts be even more uh, play a bigger role in these transformations and one of the key things that is emerging is this idea of conversations and people mm -hmm. are pointing out to the notion that you you might uh, the art can be a, a space where you you might have a really profound experience but th th also how is it, what is the importance of then having a conversation about that or connecting that to other people's experiences and so on so i think that is one of the areas that i think could be really Interesting, I think this is the kind of spaces that we need to actually develop those practices, right, of having conversations that can overcome some of these fragmentation and the sort of habits that we have out there. Maybe giving the experience of such Correct, a protected yeah. space itself, because I think we're witnessing maybe the first generations growing up, maybe uh, without the experience of fully present human conversation, it, and of course, I think also without the experience of com communicating presently with non-human entities, and I think giving the chance of that experience, like s pr um, creating a protected space right. where that experience is at least theoretically possible must be the mm. first step. And I think art is still sacred in that sense, right? Mm. Very, very interesting. I barely have to comment anything. You're <laughs> asking the questions yourself. To continue on to the question I posed to you and directed to you too as well, when these 65 or so people leave this room, are there any practices that they should try and adopt in order to accelerate this uh, inner transformation and better ask the questions? We have uh, no cell phones at conversation tables. Are there anything more? Engage with art? I, uh, well, Go no. ahead. Uh, I think being able to stand your own lack of capability. I think that's what happened to me when I started sort of trying to listen to the natural surroundings or putting myself in the natural surroundings that I realized that I, this is, uh, I don't know how to do this. I, I am very uh, like trained in reading a human built environment i can understand like the signals and process them and, and get their meaning but in a forest i was sort of at a lack of understanding and i could sense that there was meaning around me and that, that there was something in the forest that could that tried to reach me in some sense but i didn't know how to accept it and i think uh, being able to stand that feeling is a good starting point mm -hmm. because that will be that will i think that is the necessary first step uh, for like towards a real listening or a real capability because i think you have that capacity within you but um i think humanity as a whole is a practice in the sense that it has to be practiced in order to be realized and that uh, applies to listening that applies to uh, like um, interpreting the natural world and so on so you have to be uh, patient and you have to stand your own um, uh, yeah, lack of lack of capacity to build on that i think your presentation also made me think of a conversation i had with vanessa andriotti who is also part of that film and she talks about the ways in which she talks about exiled capacities this idea that that there are these in, in intrinsic capacities and like you said that that they never disappear we always have them 
but the current structures and systems and culture that we live in and we inhabit, they don't allow those capacities to be. And could it be that perhaps this, I why are we not having deeper conversations? Could it be actually an effect of the world that we live in? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, the structures that are trying to maintain themselves, maybe they are imposing on us the notion of not having conversations, right? So then I think what I would say as one of the sort of transformative uh, practices that we could carry on is like, whenever you reach out, say for instance, for a phone, because you want to check the social media or something, can you actually take one split second to become aware of what is it that you're searching for? Because I think that that is a, a point where you actually can start realizing what are the things that are habitual and they are just built in, that they, you just like being, you like behaving within the system versus that always free nature that we have, right? And so how can we actually create practice around connecting to that part of us? that is not conditioned, that will never be conditioned and so on. I think also trying to uh, remove your thinking from context in some sense, I think one very um, significant thing about the technological society, so to say, is that you every uh, basic human needs are interpreted in a very specific way, like uh, the basic human need for uh, communication is interpreted as a need for highways, for example, or um, the basic human need of talking to someone else is interpreted as a need for phones, and the basic human need for love is interpreted as the right. need to get a liking right. on Facebook. And I think sort of trying to step out of that context and asking yourself, what is the basic human need right. here? Because there's a technological system that tries to uh, force those very specific interpretations on you. But I think on a human level, it's much more more open for interpretation. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I guess what um, both you're referring f to is basically tools that help us to get out of the reactive mode and become more proactive. Mm -hmm. So we are not reactive to the thoughts and the emotions and feelings that we are having, but we actually become aware of our, our thoughts, our feelings and our bodily sensations and are able to hold on before we act on something. And I think also when it, even just bringing that to the climate discourse, um, there's a lot of reaction, um, which comes from, from many um, not so positive feelings of an anxiety, for instance. Uh, so, it's, so it's important to bring that back to, yeah, to become more present with the different feelings we have, with the feelings that others have, and be able to get to a deeper conversation, um, being aware of these things. That it sort of relates back to, um, I think, the, what I showed with um, this expanded consciousness um, discussion, um, being aware of these sensations, and then also um, our relations with ourselves and others and nature to become aware of them and get out of this reactive mode. Because I think one of the, the ideas that it's actually really established within the mainstream sustainability discourse, if you look at the sustainable development goals documents, it is clear that sustainability is not a journey of doing things a little bit better or changing a little thing here or there or kind of fixing this or that technical problem. It is a transform transformations journey. And I don't think we say the, that word perhaps too easily, but like to actually understand what it actually means that we, mm -hmm. we are facing, uh, you know, we have in, in the next two decades to have to really transform fundamentally the world. So what does that actually mean, right? And uh, I think what we are kind of contributing to some of those kind of micro mechanisms that, that are really much part of that and, and how do we actually take that seriously and not as just a buzzword, you know. All right, we've talked for roughly two hours. now. It's time for you to talk a bit as well. So these questions that have been popping up all over, uh, now is the time to pose them. I think you pose them in this microphone so that everyone can hear. Who wants to go first? Hey. No, no. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Um, I just maybe have more a reflection than a question because uh, hearing the conversation, especially now, but also going back to uh, uh, Elena when you spoke about this act of love, uh, uh, there are a, a couple of 
things that sort of struck me were also um, the example when, when you give that you move to the forest and then you encounter sort of the nature, so to say, or the forest. So <coughs> on one hand side, we have this, uh, I, I feel that what we suffer from is that we are still trying to reason in a very rational way without exposing ourselves to the encounter with the tree, with the bird, with this or with that. Because when you said that I was fascinated by the iceberg, yeah, I was fascinated by the iceberg too, because, you know, we are not exposed to the iceberg. So when we look at it, we are wow. Mm. So that is a very big gap that I think we are lacking. How do we make this exposure? And I think everyone can think of ourselves, I can, I can force myself to go there, but it's more about how do we make more than ourselves uh, come to the exposure. And the other thing for me is connected to a sense of longing. Because what we long for is the mobile phone, is uh, the speed, is the lack of conversation. We don't long for, and on an abstract level we understand that the climate change is here and it's dangerous and the world is not good, but it's still on an abstract level. We don't really long for going to that nature. So, <clears throat> and here probably uh, my question is has to do with, uh, maybe it has to do with uh, uh, trying to think what you described uh, from the beginning, how our education is built. And that's where the role of the artist, or let's say that's how the art becomes relevant again. Uh, in the same way as the world has become magical again, because we are afraid that we are losing it now, so it has started to speak to us. Uh, but it's not that it just started now, it has always spoken to humanity. Uh, so I think it, it's uh, probably the role, the role of the artist is very important uh, <clears throat> to be introduced at a very ground level in the education, because my son goes to school and he, he learns mathematics and he learns the letters and he learns how to write and how to speak and how to read. But there is, uh, of course, they exchange books and do that kind of thing, but there is not a dedicated space. We spoke about this space, right? There is not a dedicated space to develop the kind of imagination that we are speaking that is in crisis now. So probably it's there that one should go back to and, and try to think as a first step, uh, as, a, as a building block to, to start from there. It's from there that maybe one should put the efforts to try to change or to transform the situation where we are. Because I don't think we are going to transform Donald Trump even though we <laughs> would like to listen to him. <laughs> Thank you. Helena, do you want to... Yeah, I could say something about um, this approaching nature because I think there's a always a risk that you do this in a sort of touristic way, right? Because a while ago, I think knowledge about, basic knowledge at least, about nature was sort of built, it had a survival, survival value to know at least the names of what you encountered around you and so on. There is no value in this today. It seems irrelevant, right, to, the, to our way of life. This is at best some sort of esoteric knowledge, but it doesn't really fit into the lives that we imagine that we lead. So this experience of really being dependent on the natural structures can still be an abstraction, even though I go out for a hike for a few days, right? Because in my, my ordinary life, that is not my experience. Then, as I said, my experience is something completely different, that my life depends rather on the, on the infrastructure, the technological infrastructure. So that's a very, I think it's a very relevant question, how to approach nature um, in a, in a non-constructed way, how, how to do it in a natural way. And I think that's a very hard question to answer. I don't, I don't have the answer, but I think that your, um, your reflection sort of pointed towards that need um, of finding, because I mean, you can also look at the iceberg and say it's beautiful. And that's also a way of sort of removing yourself and I mean, this is an image, so maybe that's the natural, but also the real iceberg standing in front of it, you could remove yourself in the same way, right? Um, so I think that's a central question. And maybe, maybe if there is an answer, the answer might be that we cannot succeed as long as we have a way of life, we have a culture where knowledge and relation to nature doesn't serve a purpose. 
maybe maybe um, the problem is a basic step. Anybody else want to comment? Uh, yeah, I think that just the question of education is really interesting, and I'm very passionate about that as well. In terms of also revisiting the sort of central meaning of education, that like you said, there's this idea that education is about instilling concepts and, and names of forms, and so there's I can't remember the name of the poet, but he asked, "Who knows the more about a forest, the botanist, who knows the names of all the things, or the poet?" And obviously, it's a, there's no answer to the question, but the idea that education also means ex so it means like to take out. So the idea of education as a way of opening our, ourselves to the world. And I think it links to what, I guess I'm, I'm responding in the reverse order, because then you spoke about uh, ex, um, exposition, no, um, exposure, right? And I, mean, I would ask, like, what is the dis distance between you and nature, right? And, and in, in a way, it's about also questioning these ideas that makes us believe that we, are, we have to go out there to actually connect to nature and then start asking, you know, why am, I as why am I asking that question in the first place? And so on. But yes, how do we actually bring mm. that into education? It's mm. uh, I have two comments, and I'm very grateful for <laughs> your comments on, on our presentations. Um, my children also go to school um, here, obviously, and real story like, and I told you that once before, my, my daughter came home asking, Mum, um, we learn mathematics and languages and Swe well, Swedish, other languages, um, s um, science, um, biology, things like that, but why do we learn art at school? So she didn't really understand how that comes in. And I think this is just showing that there is no that that we that the whole educational system we still have art, but it we do not really know what the role it has anymore. It doesn't really have it's it's put like the at the same, and they just also understand the children understand they have to get knowledge in knowledge out, but it 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 should serve a different role. And it was irritating to my children because nobody could un explain them why they do actually now have art in addition to the, the other um, um, topics. Um, and another reflection on what you said with um, edu well, education in general, I fully agree that we should um, change some things in our educational system. And I obviously would relate that back to these transformative skills. Um, and then art plays a role and other approaches and tools also do play a role um, to, to work with children, um, to, be, to, to work on things like compassion, et cetera, et cetera. There are tools, that, like there are also this concept of emotional intelligence, and there are tools for it, like tools for mathematics. It's not that it's uh, profoundly different that there would be no tools avail available to us, um, but we haven't explored them sufficiently in our in educational system. And yeah, I also think in technology, we don't know what our children will need later on as concrete knowledge when it comes to um, concrete science. But I think when it comes to how to interrelate to oneself, others, and to nature, that's something they will also need. They will also have to know. They will, and they need an inner compass in order to be able to uh, navigate life. Um, I think yeah, we should put much more focus on that. Next question. You in the back, I think. And then you. I saw you as well. Uh, I just also, also want to just, uh, give um, a kind of um, reflection. And, I, and that um, I will quote um, Rawlings, a poet from Iceland and Canada, that in her turn is paraphrasing Robert McFarlane. Have you heard? Yeah. So the question is, what does the landscape know about you that you don't know about yourself? That was a good quote. I don't think we need to respond. No. I think it's uh, uh, this is 
this is what art can do. It can ask questions that have no answers. And, and it, what is the power of a beautiful question like that, right? What can it actually do in the life of a person? I think that's, you know, it speaks for itself. Thank you for your Thank reflection. You. We had a question or a reflection uh, up front. Uh, thank you for your, <coughs> am I on here? Yes, thank you for all your three contributions. Uh, I don't want to sign this without Corona. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm working in a field somewhere in between all of you, I think. Um, I've been working on writing about mental sustainability as a concept, trying to develop that and making art to do that. So I was wondering if either of you are working with, with thoughts about mental, the mental health crisis as connected to the climate crisis, which is an angle that I think is very important. And when you said that nobody is longing for mm -hmm. nature or, and they are rather longing for the phone, to me that's an expression of, of the unawareness of the, the deeper level of longing that is actually driving our uh, consumer culture. So to me, it's a very, very important area where we, where in a transition uh, or in a transformation is of the biggest urgency. Um, I wonder if any of you know about Thomas Hüppel and his work on collective trauma, because there seems to be a movement there also, which are trying to say, we have to try healing our collective trauma if we want it have to have any chance of, of making the other uh, transformation that, that really in a transition is a necessity to, to move on to, to outer transition. So this was not a question or maybe it was. <laughs> you, had just a question, you had a question in there. I think in, in connection to longing, I, there's another quote and I can't remember who said it, but uh, the quote is, you can never get enough of what you don't really need. And I think that's very to the point. Um, I, I also think, yeah, that that's a very superficial, also in response to the earlier reflection, I, I think that's a very superficial uh, interpretation of logging, that uh, you only long for your phone. I mean, obviously, modern technology has like very clearly makes use of basic human reward systems in the brain. I mean, in that sense, of course, probably you long more for your phone if you're sort of into that um, than you long for a clear spring in the mountains. But I, personally, I would say that I long definitely also on a um, more direct level more for the clear spring. Uh, but I have a very bad uh, old cell phone, so that's maybe um, <laughs> the reason. Uh, but uh, um, I, I think that's very interesting. How do you connect to that more basic longing? Because uh, it seems a bit, of course, uh, too simplified to say, OK, so you, uh, on a superficial level, you long for your phone, but then you have like the uh, mental health crisis. I mean, looking at youth, for example, and the uh, uh, depression going up, uh, suicide going up, and especially at a very alarming rate among young people. And you can connect that to many. I, I don't think it's very easy to connect it directly to climate change. I think it's easier to connect it more directly to the use of cell phones, for example, uh, because they're much more uh, active in, in the, the private life of, of youth. But as sort of, uh, I mean, considering the, um, that sketch from um, the primary school, right. uh, that uh, indicates I'm wrong, on the other hand, because having that concept of the future, uh, those prospects of the future, and then also tackling uh, something within yourself, that might be too much in combination. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely, it's a perspective that I think is uh, of huge relevance. That's really what I'm trying to say. Mm. Yeah. I, I could perhaps add that when I showed the two bubbles, like with the sustainability community and the consciousness community, I think on the right hand side, there's more and more on psychological. Um, yeah, sustainability, um, mental sustainability, as you say, um, very important work. And basically, also when what we then try to do in the in the um, in the course when we work with the students is we bring people in from psychology and from neuro, um, social neuro, neuroscience, 
um, from health, well-being, who do work on that side and bring them together with people who work more on this systems level and then see how we can work together. And it's extremely important. We bring people in who work on stress very much, for instance, um, and that has a huge impact. Um, like, yeah, you, you talked about the health crisis. I think stress is one big part of this health crisis. And it relates to issues that, that we mentioned before, again, like being able to be present and relate to each other that are uh, with a high stress level, we are not able to connect to others, uh, with ourselves to others or to nature. So it probably starts just there from the very beginning, if we are too involved with ourselves um, and have our traumas linking back to your other comment, we will not be able to, to, to link to others and to nature. So we do have to make this inner work first in order to be able to relate to others and to, um, and to, to our environment. And um, also this work of on trauma and collective trauma and healing, which you mentioned, I think it's also very important. It's also just starting now to bring that to the climate story. So again, there's a huge community of people and researchers working on that. Um, but it has not been br brought yet sufficiently to this other bubble of sustainability. So this is basically what we are trying to do to bring these uh, knowledge, the knowledge from different people and different disciplines together, because they are, we can so hugely uh, learn from each other, and it's really so important to do that. Mm. What's um, what's the role of death in all this? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I think we have a culture that yeah. very much, very purposefully denies death in yeah. many, and I mean, sort of never wants to mm. come close mm. to the. Um, the realization that we all will die someday. Yeah. I actually just the other day read some, um, they did some experiment where they, they let judges in court, um, who was, um, they were um, uh, deciding about a fine. And some judges were just the control group, and other judges, they, they get to answer a few questions uh, about the, the personal questions before going into court. And they added to this list of questions also a, a question, something like, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on your own mortality or something like that? And the hypothesis was that these judges, sort of being stressed by the thought of their own mortality, it would uh, be um, give larger fines because that would sort of awaken the reaction in them to uh, rule and order and sort of like that that would be the impulse awakened by uh, knowing your own mortality. But the scientists were, so that was the hypothesis, and it, it seemed, it, it was correct. But they were shocked how correct it was, mm -hmm. because these judges that were just like finally reminded of their mortality, um, they made the fines nine times larger. <laughs> and I think that has some sort of bearing on this, right? Like how, because the climate change and all of this is a very potent reminder of not just the individual mortality, but also the finiteness of humanity. And this is never really spelled out because we're talking about like te technological fixes and how mm -hmm. to change society and so on. But so that's yeah. What what about, what about death? Do we need to talk about death and mortality in order to mm -hmm. progress? Because I think the judge just showed that the the subconscious reaction mm -hmm. to this reminder uh, seems to be large. But like, um, I I really like the way you characterized. You know, way you the, the way you painted for us a picture is actually a movement. Uh, in history of going from ideas of control and in a way we could assume that the culture we live in that we grew up in is a culture that tries to establish its control yes. over the, the out world out there mm. but actually we live in a moment where the planet is actually showing to us that we, can't. That is, we cannot control yeah. death is another one that you cannot control right. The idea of having deep conversations is another example in the micro situation that you cannot control because mm -hmm. you never m know where a conversation might go. Yes. So what I'm getting at is that in a way it's, it's this transition between going from a command and control mm -hmm. to something that is much more open-ended yes. and, 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 and attentive to. And, and I think what we all listen, listing here, it's like different capacities or different um, features of our lives that are being sort of cut out 
because we live inside this sort of command <coughs> control that, that's also what comes back in, in the younger generation that uh, tend to prefer texting right. to speaking they also um, they often uh, put forward this big advantage that you can have complete control over what you uh, it seem to be yeah. because you can edit yeah. your right. yeah and you can also turn the other person off if right. it's too, so, so that my Very control yes. is um, explicitly put forward as an yeah. advantage yeah. of um, a digital culture. Fascinating. Just on a, a personal level, we have this uh, book club at the university where researchers read climate fiction books and connect them to the Gosh quote about crisis of imagination. It started as a way of just exploring these literature as a way to think about the future. It, it has ended up almost like a support group <laughs> because we realize that all of us were harboring these like really dark emotions about the future. Fantastic. And when you put yourself in the futures through literature, through art, then you, you have to relate to them somehow. You bring them up to the fore and you can discuss them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that would be a really few fruitful way of talking about these mm. futures. What, um, what can you recommend? In the section of climate. Oh, I have fiction. a l I have a long list of recommendations. Oh, yeah. We've okay. been going for more than two years oh. now. So okay. I can give okay. it to you later. I'm not going to get you started now. Okay. <laughs> I I only wanted to add to that conversation that I it, we just have to dare to ask the big, big questions. And I liked very much what that person in your video clip showed when he said we have to start big before we take things apart. And it relates a bit to that because we have ended up to looking too much into the the parts and mm -hmm. we forgot the big picture and also in science we have to dare to ask the big questions um yes and there was something else i wanted to say and i forgot so i will come back to it later it comes back it comes back <laughs> next question hello Hi. so uh, i was wondering um if you think that the cause of our inability to handle the climate problems would be that we believe that man is separated from nature and that we think that the universe is mechanical. For example, there is an author that's called uh, Bischof Capra, and he wrote a book that was called uh, The Tao of Physics, and he, he meant that uh, the Western uh, worldview is not very adequate. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts? Uh, I am. Um my experience is that many physicists are skeptical <laughs> of Rich of Capra. But I think a more direct uh, reason is, I think, even having written books about this problem that you mentioned, that the idea of humans separated from nature and so on, I still have sort of an instinctive belief that technology will fix it and that science will fix it. I think that's a very integral part of our worldview. I think that's central part of the problem. That's where we feel safety. Mm. How do we transfer the feeling of safety to the natural? Well, you can never be exactly safe because nature is not possible. I think maybe the problem then would be the linking of safety and control, <laughs> um, which means that everything that is alive is threatening in some sense. So yeah, I'm, I'm repeating myself maybe, but I think uh, maybe it's not that schematic that the idea of, but I think definitely what someone in one of your films was getting at the dualism, like the idea of, I mean, and the, and the dualism is not something that was like died with Descartes and is now out of the question after um, the enlightenment, is the word in English? I mean, it's not, but the point is that uh, the dualism is definitely not dead. It's quite alive and well, only in a new shape. I mean, the idea of uh, um, genes, for example, the information as the substance of, of living beings, or only the um, software and hardware. I mean, we have this dualism all over the place, only sort of, but not in the, what it was, uh, what it used to be, the religious context but in a, a non-religious context where it sort of is still at work, really. And that's, I think, part of the problem. I, I would just want to confirm from a science perspective that we are definitely moving from an understanding of climate change as a technological problem to an understanding of climate change as a social problem and a, as a relational problem um, related to the, um, yeah, um, what's the word, the disconnect between oneself, others, 
and the world. So I think that is along the lines that you were, um, yeah. Uh, but who are we? That's the scientists. Because yes. I think in practice you still have the, t I mean, yeah, everything yeah, can be fixed by technology. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. still pretty So basically dominant, what, I, yeah. what I, I showed at the beginning when I started that what is the dominant approach? That's obviously not there yet. The dominant approach is not that climate change is a social problem, a problem of relationship. This is where we, I think, would agree and w where uh, some are trying to push the discussion towards. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have, sorry, does anybody have a question before that hasn't asked a question yet? We have one here. You will get your chance eventually, just. Hey, is this working yet? Yeah? Yes. So I just, for one moment, would like to picture us, picture or imagine a place in the future where we have established a new way of living, um, where we live in sustainability with ourselves, with each other, and with the world around us. If we imagine that transition, if we imagine it like a movement, how do the three of you personally believe that movement would, what, what would that movement look like for us here? Mm. Thank you. Well, I think this should be the topic of a whole workshop. We should continue here <laughs> over the weekend and do it together. A life's work. Yeah, there would be. Well, I, I think it is an, an open conversation that needs to be uh, done in that way. I have, I have more to answer, but you, you have. Well, I need the artist for that okay. question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also use storytelling now also in actually with students that they we try like uh, you're trying with your work. We try to support students and also what you said about um, um, the lack of imagination, try to sort of support um, others in their imagination. I don't think that any of us knows the answer because I think the answer has to come in relation to each other. Mm. Um, maybe I think I may be the, um, the least optimistic person on this panel, but I would say that uh, I don't think that this transformation can go smooth, like we have this intact society and we change our minds and then we sort of just adjust everything. And I think I, I think you can hope that the economical collapse precedes the ecological collapse. That's something you can hope, because then people will be forced into new ways of subsistence and there will still be something to subsist upon, so to speak. I mean, you would still have intact ecosystems that uh, can give life. But I, I'm very pessimistic as to the idea that, you, that the transformation will be, will be smooth, as I said, yeah. But I think you can prepare. I mean, prepare for a situation where transformation is, I mean, outer transformation is forced upon you. You can definitely prepare for that situation by learning to communicate with other people, learning to communicate and listen to nature and the needs of nature and sort of try to enter into a more uh, humble. humble relation to the non-humans around you. You can prepare for this in, in every way, but I, my belief is that it, there will be, because we still feel that we have something to lose, right? I think that's a central point. You, we feel that we have something to lose, and, and as long as we feel that, I think what we will protect is not the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We will protect that um, that we feel is our safety or our privilege and so on. So, But definitely, um, when that privilege goes away, that's a different situation, and you can definitely prepare for that situation uh, with workshops like this. Hi, I just wanted to add on that I, I'm not um, uh, maybe super optimistic myself, but I do think that, yeah, we, we do feel that we have a lot to lose, but I, my, I also feel that a growing number of people uh, is longing for a change, a change in their everyday life uh, that would not mean that they feel like they are living uh, in destruction. I think 
this longing is growing and growing. Uh, so, uh, yes, considering how our lives look right now, we would have to be prepared to lose what we know. But I also think that there is a potential in this longing that I can sense in myself and around me for a life that is that doesn't feel destructive. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a potential. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we uh, I, I talked to her about this museum that we created, and I mean, we we set the boundary condition that we had to meet the climate goals, but everything else was up for speculation. And so the world we created, I mean, it was not a utopia. Uh, things went horribly wrong. There was a lot of pain, a lot of mistakes along the way. Uh, but still, when people <laughs> left it, everybody almost unanimously said, oh, yeah, this was really good. I'm really hopeful about the future now. And to me, that was a bit strange, uh, a bit horrifying. Uh, and so I think it's really useful to start imagining it, but also mm. to, as you say, be open that it might not be pain-free and think, how can we handle that as a society? Mm. Mm. I think that this work here that you're doing with your work, with that exhibition and, and the work we are doing um, is in a way also to support that hope and that agency um, to for people to become active. Like if you remember the the um, transformative skills, one is related to agency, empowerment, and it's it's related to engagement. And you purposely also remember the poster where I said, what will happen if we truly believe that we actually make a difference? Um, and that's, yeah, it's, it's really powerful and important and related to what you said, that there's an increasing belonging. I can definitely support that when I, when you look into the students, um, that are coming, that are work, uh, our, our institutions. Um, and when you start working on this inner, outer transformation aspect, um, there's more and more, it, it resonates with this belonging. And some of the statements from students were that for the, f that have heard for two years about climate change and destruction, the, the a typical comment from students is that for the first time in my master program or during the last two years, I feel hope again. And this is something they want, they want to find hope again and want to engage. Um, and we are, we should be ready for, um, supporting each other to actually, yeah, um, move on towards that transformation because there is increasing interest and um, readiness for it. A, a colleague of mine, a good friend, that uh, David Tabara, that I work very closely to, he always speaks about this idea of um, moving uh, audiences from feeling that you are a spectator in mm. the sort of the drama of unsustainability to be in an active participant on that and how do you, how do you actually create those spaces of agency and that you feel yeah. that you are part of it and um which has to do with responsibility then i guess because if you're an active participant right. in destruction right that's something right. else than being but on the other hand that shouldn't lead to like consumer agency right right you also have to problematize that what, what's the implication of that description correct but like to counter a little bit on the on the idea of pessimism or optimism, I think it, there are examples in history where we did very profound transformations that we wouldn't even imagine. You know, think and I'm not sure if it's fair the example, but think about slavery or you know, human rights and all of that. I think we went through these very profound things. They were not without uh, costs, costs <laughs> and they were painful, um, but they do suggest that there is a possibility for doing that kind of profound transformation. Um, and yeah, perhaps it's a way of, w it's about thinking how do we create and practices that actually get us uh, into that agency part of it. All right, questions. We have, so if you wanted to ask your question, uh, and then you. Yeah, um, just following up on the discussion of also a bit earlier, uh, without wanting to add a new dichotomy, <laughs> Sorry for that, but uh, <coughs> um, we've talked about the the notion of control uh, and hearing also how it, how it was laid out and the move from the hunter gatherer society to uh, agricultural society. It also has to do with uh, control has to do with the fear of losing something that we are talking about, but it's 
for me it's more specific to the fear of losing something personal like a property mm. that I own while the other side of it would be for me coexistence so you would have control and coexistence in coexistence you are not or uh, what you are afraid to lose in coexistence is something that belongs to everybody and what you are afraid to lose in control is something that you are afraid that it's yours mm. so maybe that's where the big shift has to happen that we need to all understand that what we are losing is something that belongs to everybody but i don't think we have come there yet and to go mm -hmm. back to that the notion of the longing uh, it, it's also uh, something it's a construct but it's also something that is embedded uh, in us and why i gave the example of the telephone is that because we are fed with that kind of longing it's not lo i mean of course the, the longing as a process is integrated in us but we are fed so everything has to do with how can we think of feeding ourselves with mm -hmm. the right kind of longing mm -hmm. longing mm -hmm. thank you i think we had a comment over here as well. yeah, it's actually a, a recommendation. Um, I, I guess you, some of you must know Joanna Macy, who's an ecologist who's been doing a lot of workshops. Uh, I just read something, I can't quote the, the words exactly, but she says something like, we, we cannot know before we die if we are the, the, the vigils at the, the deathbed of a civilization or the, the what's it called, um, the one who, who Barnmorske, also. Uh, yeah. Barnmorske, uh, uh, at the, the birth of, of uh, midwife. midwife. <laughs> the midwife at the birth of a, of a new, a new world, and mm. so we have to to act as best we can. And she has these workshops called uh, Active Hope or the work that reconnects, that are facilitated by people all over the world, which are trying to, in a very very simple way, move you from despair to active hope, via confronting grief which is sort of seems to be a very, very essential that, that if we cannot, as you said, that, that people come to a mu museum and even though they see something horrible, they feel enlivened and invigorated and empowered afterwards. And maybe I think it's important that, that by facing grief and the pain of what we are losing, we might, that might be the only way to, to be empowered to, to do something about it and to sort of find some hope in, in all the darkness anyway. And within that project, we've worked a lot with the church, and that's been really fascinating because they are experts at dealing with grief. And they are now kind of talking, how can we, within our community, handle this new type of grief that we previously maybe didn't think we had to handle? Mm -hmm. And so that's, it's going to be really interesting to see where they come mm -hmm. up. I just wanted also to reflect that these are the tools that we also used um, in the context of the course and re referring back to you at one point today said practice is crucial mm. and I think that's also especially when we talk about this um, um, it's so crucial to also in at school or at university or in private life to not only engage in these topics in theoretical terms but engage and practice um, doing things differently, um, practice doing things based on our values or things like that. We have to practice things. And so we, we, we introduce different practices um, amongst others, the ones you mentioned. And then we, we have a practice lab which runs along the course, which is more than knowledge based and providing theory and things. Because I'm also a, um, very much convinced that whatever we learn, we have to practice in any way in order to then really get to something and to something transformative. Mm. I mean, I think, yeah, that the Joanna Mason is really inspiring and, and I think uh, some of her work also points to the fact that these sort of great transformations, they, they are really, really, I mean, we're talking about really profound changes and, you know, just look, if you, if you look at the, um, what is happening now with coronavirus? I mean, it's quite amazing how people mobilize. I just read an article that you know, uh, air, air companies, uh, flight companies are kind of expecting a big loss. Airports are empty. The environmental movement have been trying that for decades. It never worked. So how come people actually all of a sudden stop flying? 
that's amazing. That's great. Yeah, that's and and I think it is. That's why I, I'm pointing to something that is fundamental. I think people are acting out of fear, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's a fear that it's actually impacting me. It's my body. So it's really at the level of the per perception because we act in that way for something that I perceive it will impact me, but I don't do anything for climate breakdown that is, you know, uh, is the sixth mass it's extinction. So it's a, it's a really dissonant thing that I really, I think it's a pointer for how profound these kind of transformations need to go, right? But what about the opinion that fear is not the way forward? Well, that, that sort of negates exactly that, right? Exactly. You I just mean have to people in, in com climate communication, there's been lots of studies claiming that uh, we shouldn't do that kind of doom and gloom communication that scientists mm -hmm. have been trying because fear doesn't work. Yeah. Well, this proves this <laughs> proves <laughs> that they're wrong. <laughs> yes. I, I, so I guess the I difference think is that if it's short or long term. Yes, yes, that's the so difference. I think it's yes. it, it works very well in short term, but it will probably not make people being engaged. Right. But it's a very short term because I can imagine mm. that my kids will suffer mm. from this. Mm. That's, that should be very direct, mm. but it's obviously not direct enough mm. because they won't mm die tomorrow mm -hmm. and I mean right. that's just a very short that right. proves something about the human yes. way of reasoning. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess it's uh, also just linking it back to um, how important it is not to tend to address these aspects but also link them to the practical the political sphere obviously uh, one can have regulations and things mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. then go hand in hand and we need them it's not right. we should not leave that room saying we should not um, um, work only on this in aspects we have to bring them together with the policy level and the and the practical level so that then together we can move forward mm. yeah because the risk one. of the inner transformation is making this into a private problem right. yes. which it is definitely yes. not right yeah. mm -hmm. feels like we're uh, reaching some really uh, <laughs> insightful comments here uh, we had a question here okay um, thank you very much or all these interesting thoughts. Um, I was just considering the power, like political power, and how it comes that uh, it seems to flow in completely wrong direction, <laughs> like far from what is needed. Um, and if you have any thoughts on that topic, like how how could we or someone facilitate power or this? You very useful perspectives, as we were discussing here, moving to people with power, like political power and other instances. I know it's a big question, but yeah, thank mm. you. How can you put someone who actually realize the, realizes the problem into power? Is that the question? Or yeah. put the realization in the people, in with, the people power. with power? Okay, there are Either two different, um, yes. Um, but it also relates to Diego's comment. At one point, you said, "Well, we, the art, we artists, we don't have, we are not in places of power." You said something before, something like that. So I think there's also work to do. To yeah, mm. it's the society who gives power to certain disciplines, to certain um, capacities. Yes, to certain types of. Pe I was just thinking about the word empathy that was in mm. your presentation. I'm thinking of the people who reach power within this context. Um, their most form. Um, I mean, th I don't think that empathy is a word that characterizes them, mm. so to speak. Uh, I, I, you need a system that um, really. English vocabulary promotes. Uh, promotes. Thank you. I was reaching it. <laughs> uh, that promotes empathy and social skills and listening and and humbleness and so on. And you know we don't have that type of system today. So I think it's an sort of interlinking between building the system and reaching the people within the system, right? Yeah, I think it's it it, re it circles back to what we said before. Also, in terms of uh, in a way, power is flowing to the places that can maintain the system as it. It, it tries to recreate itself, right? Mm. And so, uh, when, when we're talking about transformations, then I think, we, yeah, we're talking about what are these leverage points? Where are the places that you can actually start intervening to change? And I think you showed this interesting uh, metaphor that Donella Meadows uses uh, of the, the perhaps there are different strengths of these leverage points, and maybe working at the level as we're talking about here, worldviews and. Uh, and ideas, and um, that could be one way to to address that. I, and apart from that, 
Uh, maybe it's just uh, maybe the um, solution is to start questioning what, what power is. I mean, to recognize what power is, because power is really, in the last instance, the power that you give someone. Right? Not not even the the top boss has power if you don't grant him in most cases this power. So maybe that is the most constructive starting point, like questioning the power that should be questioned, and also asking yourself how to uh, not. Uh, enact power over others, but sort of start to take control, control in the good sense over your own situation. There mm -hmm. was in, I'm not sure, if, is there any Norwegian in the uh, audience? Uh, I remember in, in Norway there was this program where uh, kids could adopt a politician. So the kids will form a group of 10 kids around a politician and they will be there. <laughs> so they, the politician needed to ask questions and they would, give, they would be a, a, a assess, assessors. They would, and I think that's a, you know, it shows how you know, there are creative things that we can do around this, that you, we don't have to just say, oh, this is the political system and this is the power structure, as if it's like this solid monument out there, we could actually start tweaking with it and intervening in it in, in creative ways. So we, yeah. we had a youth summit at the UN in, in New York preceding to the climate summit. And uh, Guterres, uh, the secretary mm -hmm. general, he was a keynote listener. I mean, it, it, he could have done a lot more, but it was quite cool to see him. Just He wasn't saying much. He was sitting there listening to perspectives and taking it. So I think that's a really mm -hmm. good point. Mm -hmm. I we just want to relate it back to the iceberg, <laughs> that obviously power structures are very um, powerful, but they're often invisible. And in a way, we need to make them visible and then change patterns that are there. Um, and we have to address them and make them visible and, and address them. And again, arts can <laughs> play a role in that, certainly to, to give more voice to people that are not heard, for instance, to change power structures. So we're nearing the end, unfortunately, of this seminar. So now is the time to ask any last questions. We have one there. Any more? I want to try and collect them all. I'm going to give you a few seconds more. And we had one more. So there we go. You and then you for a final question. Yeah, so I would like to continue a bit on the political uh, theme there. Uh, so I was thinking capitalism. The, the cap I mean, the motor in the capitalist system is greed, right? Greed for profit. So, and I think that one can argue that one of the one of the causes for the climate problems is the capitalist system. So, I'm wondering, like, can socialism be a better alternative? Do you think? Or so, communism. We'll take the last question, and then we'll. The question is, it's, uh, I heard a lot of people say, or uh, someone say, that, that like there's a tipping point for the climate, there is also something you could call a social tipping point, that if 10% of the population has changed their minds about how we want to live in the world, that will actually have its own impact. So that is why just starting in a transformation really makes a lot of sense, because we can spread that in a way that if we reach these 10%, we might actually influence politicians too, because that's the way politicians will will go, where the, the big uh, sort of momentum goes. Mm -hmm. Whether so that's socialism mm -hmm. or which mm -hmm. probably. So 65 people here, 65 <laughs> people the next time. We're getting there. Yeah, no, it's, 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 yeah. I'm familiar with that research that, um, and I think it's quite powerful, that information, to say there is a threshold of around 10%. Um, gives perhaps a bit more hope <laughs> um, in relation to the previous discussion. Um, I'm not sure if I want to comment <laughs> too much on the other um, yeah, aspect. I just want to say um, often when it's about the underlying iceberg aspect, it's, it's often about isms, all kinds of isms, um, which can be there. Um, if it's capitalism or other uh, consumerism or other isms, um, and perhaps uh, just a word of caution to perhaps differentiate between um, religion as institution and religion as belief. Mm -hmm. 
I, I could comment on that first question. I think that uh, to begin with, capitalism is definitely a problem, especially capitalism allied to technological uh, development. I mean, that's definitely a problem. But I would say that capitalism and socialism, in the historical sense at, uh, at least, have more in common in this context, I think, that, that what, what in the, way, the ways that they differ, uh, especially in the regarding the relation to nature as some sort of commodity that can be used for human purposes, I would say that uh, traditional socialism is definitely not the way to go. But egalitarianism, or I mean, some sense of <laughs> spreading the wealth in a more egalitarian way is definitely the way to go. But I wouldn't call that socialism. Um, maybe also the scale. I think that also, uh, from my rudimentary understanding of socialism, I, I think that it's a quite a large scale uh, system, right? That you have like a, a global view, not global, but you have an, a large scale uh, type of reasoning. I'm thinking that local community has to be much more important in some sort of uh, start uh, to a solution. As uh, the response to an earlier question, this is a research project, a, s a whole seminar in itself. It's a really complicated. Yes. Said the political scientist. Said the political <laughs> scientist. Of course, we need funding. <laughs> uh, so I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank, thank you, you. so much. Uh, I've learned a lot. I hope you also learned a lot. Does the museum want to say something else? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I, I heard you could continue the discussions. Uh, oh, yes. That's something to say. You can continue the discussion. Do you yes, want to use that we, the museum, uh, if you want to continue talk about this with each other and with us, uh, the museum cafe will keep open until 8 and they have some after work prices for us. So we can all meet there. Thank you so much. A Thank big you. hand of applause for that. Thank you.